great to be here. I feel like I've already been greatly ministered uh, to by the, by the two talks. Um, I'm, I'm sure that's the, the case for all of us. Uh, well, I'm going to kick off by talking about personality tests. I don't know about you. I love them. You might, uh, I inflict them on my colleagues all the time and they get sick of me. Oh, Dave, not another personality test. Um, in case you're wondering, my Myers-Briggs is ENFJ, which apparently uh, means that I make rash, rash decisions without considering the consequences and I am an extreme conflict avoider. Uh, that's what an ENFJ is. I'm sure there's some good things somewhere. Um, if you've done the Enneagram, oh, I'm an Enneagram 7. They're the fun-loving um, and pain-avoiding people. That's me. Um, I don't know if you've done the Patrick Lencioni's Working Genius. Uh, I've done that one. You can talk to me at lunchtime about that. Uh, I've done Belbin team roles, strength finders, and even Jordan Peterson's personality test. So what I love about them is everyone that I do, it just gives us a little bit more clarity and insight into, into myself, which I, I find, find quite fascinating, um, finding out about myself. But what I really love about personality tests is when I do them uh, with someone else, or with teams of people, and I go, oh, so you don't think the same way that I do. You don't like the things that I like doing. Uh, when it comes to work, you know, I'm way down the uh, early phase of uh, invention and wondering how can we do this better, whereas I've got team members that hate doing that stuff and they just want to get things finished. And so like, okay, I didn't realise it about you. you. You wouldn't know that just by looking at someone. And so these, these tests, they give you a new perspective, they give you a new insight into, into the people around you. And that's what I want to do for you with work today. I want to give you a new insight. I want to reframe your thinking as if, oh, I've never actually thought about work like that. And so that's, that's what we're doing. I'm going to give you three images to take away. And uh, let me just get the slides started. Uh, three images that you can take away, hopefully will be burnt in your brain. I've got a few videos, because I like, I like videos. Most of them are pretty short, one of them's a bit longer, but I'll explain that as we, as we go through. Um, and so I want you now to imagine your work. Ima like think in your mind, the, the place that you work or the place that you hope to work one day, if you're not working or if you're retired, which I don't think is anyone, um, but the place that you used to work, um, you know, it could be a home, an office, a classroom, a boardroom, where, whatever it is, imagine that place. Okay, so imagine the physical place. Imagine the people there that you work with. Imagine the work that you do. Okay. How are you thinking about that place? Like, what, what comes to mind? Uh, what do most people think about when they think about their work, and I'm going to put out a few images that aren't the ones I want you to remember first. So, uh, not that one. The first one is, you probably can't read it, but the subtitle for this grumpy old workers handbook is, I owe, I owe, it's off to work. I go, a grumpy perspective on the daily grind. I think that's, that sums up a lot of people in our society. You go to work because you need to pay the bills, you owe, you owe money on your house or on other things, and you're really just treading water until retirement. That's how a lot of people think about work, and that's when you get your life back. It's like, oh, I finally got rid of that thing called work. Um, most people think about work as the place that makes them tired, uh, the place that is just so busy with so many post-it notes and bits of paper that uh, you feel like you're, you're dying. Uh, and this is a big one that I find uh, in churches a lot, is that work is kind of like this, this no-go zone. It's, uh, it's to be sealed off like a crime scene. Okay? You're not allowed to talk about work. And uh, I don't know if you've ever, ever happened at, at church. It's happened uh, to me. I've even said it myself. Is uh, Someone at church says, how's work going? And if you don't just go, oh, busy, you, you say something like, oh, let's not talk about work here. Okay, because we're at church, let's talk about important things, right? Let's talk about Romans, or, you know, let's talk about the sermon. And I feel at that moment, people are making a huge mistake. They are, they're, they're compartmentalizing their work and sealing it off as if the sermon had nothing to say about their work. Okay? As if life, and the Christian life doesn't happen over there. Work, it's, it's boring, dangerous, seal it off, 
but oh, at church, now I come alive because this is where life really is. And so that, these are kind of negative, unhelpful images that people have about their work. And here is, here is another one. Um, it's a racetrack. Okay? Just, just work with the metaphor here, right? You go around and around <laughs> and you get nowhere. Right? It's uh, the same old thing year after year after year. You have a few pit stops and uh, you kind of refuel, you get, get retreaded, that might be your holidays, kind of get put back together, and then you go and do it again, and do it again, but you're really not getting, getting anywhere. Uh, and your fuel is just running out all the time. So you can probably notice the common thread through all of those things. It's that work is negative. It's a necessary evil. And so the three images I want to reshape or rehabilitate, just like if you were doing a personality test with someone, you're like, oh, okay, I didn't realise that you were like that. Here are the three images that I want to, to kind of burn into your brains. They're all from the Bible, but they're often not applied to work. And so that, that's kind of the twist. And the first one is of a refinery. They are complicated pieces of work, refineries. I mean, just look at all the, the pipes <laughs> on that picture. Right, there is, there's some complicated stuff going on. Do you know how a refinery works? Unless you're an engineer, you've probably got no idea. I'm going to sh show you the first short video. 25 seconds of this will probably do us. Let's see if we can get... Refining begins with a process called distilling. After oil is superheated, it becomes vapor. The vapor is fed into the distillation unit. As it rises and cools, the vapor turns back into a liquid. Using stacks of trays, the liquid is easily collected and separated by weight. The lighter and medium weight liquids require less processing before they're ready to be used in cars and trucks. The heavier liquids need more processing to become useful. A process called cracking is used to maximize the usefulness of heavy oil. Right, heavy look, oil has yeah. long strips. You probably didn't think you were coming uh, to learn about that today. Uh, refineries work by um, putting the raw materials through a series of processes, often quite complex, uh, and often involving a lot of heat, so intensity, and then they, they're doing that to make the raw product refined, usable and um, costly to, to people. So when you step into your workplace, you, know, you walk along and you, you get in the car park, get out of the car park and in, into your office, or wherever it is, your hospital, school, whatever, I want you to imagine that you have stepped into a refinery. That God is doing a refining work in you in that place. I, I got this idea from Eugene Peterson, uh, who says, I'm prepared to contend that the primary location for spiritual formation is in the workplace. I have found that with most people, they actually think that the opposite is true. That uh, they think that church is the place where they grow. Now, I'm not saying that church is not the place where people grow as a Christian, okay? So don't hear me saying that. But they, they kind of think, oh, I grow at church... And work is, well, it's just work. They, they like the crime scene, they, they rule it out as a place where God will shape them and refine them. But here, Eugene Peterson saying, is the primary place. So you see how someone after church saying, oh, let, let's not talk about work, is actually, um, you know, let's talk about the sermon. They just haven't put the two together. It's like the, the thing that is being taught is meant to shape what goes on at work? I mean, just the simple fact that there's so many hours that you spend there should kind of get you thinking that this is a place where you are going to be formed. People think that they, spiritual harm happens there, not, not spiritual formation. Now, so I want to say it again, don't get me wrong, you do grow at church, but it's so often the workplace where what you learn at church is put into practice. Uh, it's probably not that helpful to debate whether... The workplace is the primary, primary place, uh, whether you might be formed more or less uh, in, in marriage. Marriage does form and refine you. Having children uh, forms and, and, and refines you, yes. But what is desperately needed here is a reminder that we are being formed at work. 
Now, my job with City Bible Forum brings me into contact with workers all the time. That's what I do. I catch up with people close or, or in and around their, their workplaces, often talking about their work. And so some of the things that comes up over and over again uh, is things like ethics. Uh, how can I live out what I believe at work? Uh, it might be to do with the environment and what their company does, does with the environment and their environmental footprint. Uh, maybe it's about how people... Uh, treat other people at work, uh, how you treat colleagues, how you treat customers. Um, ambition comes up a lot. Is it right for a Christian to be ambition? What level of ambition is appropriate for a Christian? Can you take that promotion? Can I climb the ladder? What does that look like? Uh, how should I react when the, t when the going gets tough at work, which it almost always is, when there's deadlines and pressures and redundancies? How do you think through those things as, as a Christian? How might God be shaping me through these things? Uh, there's, of course, the area of relationships. How, you, how do you show love to others? Uh, do you show favoritism in the workplace? What about your purity? Um, what about how you commend the gospel through the life that you live? Or do you turn people off because of the way you work? Uh, if they ever found out that, that you were a Christian, does that, does that put them off the gospel? You could view all the things that happen at work as inconveniences. And that is my default too. Uh, I work in Christian ministry and I've got to catch myself with this, te this teaching and go, oh yeah, that conflict that, that I'm helping people navigate or that, that, that issue uh, or that whatever's going on, I'm quick to think, oh, I just wish it would go away. <laughs> Rather than this idea that God will be shaping and refining me through this. Uh, I just want to... Um, show you from the Bible how this works. Um, James chapter 1, uh, verses 2 to 4 says, Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. Did you hear what he said? Count it all joy. Not as an inconvenience to get rid of. Not as something to kind of pray away as fast as possible. Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet or face trials of various kinds. Why? James will go on to say, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Perfect and complete is the idea of growing up to be a, a fully formed, um, mature person from, from childhood. How do you get there? The Bible consistently says it is trials. Trials are the things that shape us and grow us. It's the hard things that God does his work in and through. And so that, that redundancy that you might be, be facing is like, God is, God is shaping you through that. He is, he is refining you. That conflict at work, God is refining you through that. He, he is teaching you things. That hard boss, that colleague that you don't really want to speak with, God is using each and every one of them, if you have eyes to see, to grow you and change you, to make you more patient, to make you more loving, to have greater insight into other people. Uh, just, just one book over to, to show you that this is, um, this is a consistent theme. 1 Peter, uh, chapter 1, verse uh, 6. In this you rejoice, that is your salvation. Though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. I would include work trials in that. Not just persecution but various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and, and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what I want to do is, the first image is to, is to, is to reframe how you think about your, your work. When you step into your workplace, I want you to think, I work in a refinery. This is a place where God is shaping me and changing me, purifying me, strengthening my faith. God is using me. God is using these people. God is using these trials and producing something beautiful and precious in me. Now, I think it, that image alone will just transform the way you think about your daily work. Uh, but there's a few more that I want us to, to think about in the Bible. The second image that I want you to consider uh, is, well, let me hold off before I ask you a question. Where do you think God is praised? 
Okay, the obvious answer, most people think, is places like this, uh, or places like that, that is where God is praised, or places like this. Um, where is God praised? Most people think in these, these places. Uh, he's praised in beautiful places, purpose-built places, uh, cathedrals, like the one I showed you, uh, built to communicate that you are escaping the mundane and you're entering into a holy space. Uh, the height of the ceiling is meant to kind of draw your gaze up to the, to the transcendent, to, to the other, to the one that is above all, God. Now, don't get me wrong, again, God is praised in these places, okay? I <laughs> Would, wouldn't be so bold to say that God is not praised in these places. But what I, what I want to suggest that you is unhelpful is if we contain the praise of God to these places alone. And so this is where I'm going to show you a second video. This is the longest one. It goes for about five minutes, but I just want you to relax. You, know, you can close your eyes, listen, a bit of a change of pace. Um, it, it was shot during, during COVID, and uh, it starts in a cathedral, uh, and then kind of goes out, and then there's images from all around the world, and just kind of ponder that thought while the song is being sung, and I'll kind of bring it all together after the video. So hope you enjoy yeah, context for that is that uh, that was released just as COVID was, was hitting and it was, a, it was a fundraiser for getting medical supplies to the hospitals uh, around the world that needed it and that's why all the streets are empty, of, of course. Um, but when I saw that a few years ago, I thought that beautifully il illustrates the point that I'm trying to make here, uh, that we so often think that the praise of God is contained to, to buildings where we sing praise to, to God, but... I just love the way that you get this, this sense that amazing grace uh, kind of can be washed over all the things that we do uh, in New York and Mexico City and Buenos Aires and, and Beijing, that the praise of God is not contained to a place. And um, as you read the Bible, one of the key ways that God is praised is through our good works of which our daily work is a subset of the good works that God has given us to, to walk in. And so when you step into your workplace, I want you to imagine that you are, you are working in a cathedral of praise to, to God, that, that this place, that, this hospital, this, this, uh, this school, this office building, wherever it is, out on the construction site, God is being praised here through the work that I'm doing and through the way that I conduct myself in this place. So let me show you um, from, from the Bible, uh, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verse 14, which says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Now listen to this. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. How is God praised? How is God given glory here? Through people seeing the good works that you are doing. Which is not just being nice to people although it includes that, but it includes the work that you do. And there's no reference to, to place here. It doesn't say go into a church building and that is where, God, uh, you know, where people will give glory to God. Its reference is, a, is an activity. Let them see your good works and that will result in glory to God. Now you can ask me in question time about how I think that, that might work. Um, but just to show you that it's not just one, one reference, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12 says, the reason I've got this little Bible is I actually left my Bible at the village church weekend away where I was, where I was preaching, so it's, uh, it, it is around somewhere, um, and, and I have been emailed, I just need to get it back. Um, so um, I'm not using my, my normal Bible. Always leave something at a church camp, I'll tell you what, uh, 
umbrellas and all sorts of things. Um, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12 says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honourable. Okay, so you're, you're, you're a Christian, you're out there in the world, you're keeping your conduct honourable, pure. Um, why? So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Once again, it is your, your good deeds that result in the praise of God. Uh, the good that we do is one of the ways that God is praised in this world. And so um, Martin Luther had this great, great saying. I'm pretty sure it was Luther. He said, we might pray for our daily bread in the Lord's Prayer, but it's the bakers who rise early in the morning to bake it. God is providing for his world through the good works of people's occupations. Uh, it's an expression of our love for neighbour. So if you're a teacher, the good works that you, you, you have are those 30-odd faces that are smiling back at you in the morning. They are your good work, teaching them. If you're in construction or engineering, it's the project that you are working on, the things that you are building that brings order to, to our society, that brings people together, that, that bridge your building, that, that road, that whatever it is, the, the building is an expression of your good work that God has given to you to do. And we could go on through all the different categories of uh, you know, the, the justice professions, the healing professions, uh, those involved with, with uh, creativity and, and the like. Um, and in our workshop, what I hope to do is to hear what your profession is, uh, you know, if it's small enough, to go through everyone and to help you to make the connections. How is God using you to bring about God's purposes and God's plans in, in the world? So your daily work, I put it to you, is conducted in the sight of others and for the benefit of others, and as you do that, it brings praise to God. Your daily work is done before others, for the benefit of others, as an expression of your love for your neighbours, and through that brings praise to God. So, two images so far. I work in a refinery, and God is using your daily work to, to grow you and to refine you. The second image is that you work in a cathedral of praise. God is praised here in my place of work. The final image that I want you to get is that of a, a farm. I want you to think that you're stepping into a farm when you go to work, wherever your workplace is. It is a farm at harvest time. So um, I'm going to show you another short video and it'll be completely obvious what, what passage I'm going to go to after, after this. So let's, let's do the final one, just 20 seconds or so. Well, times are really quite tough for the strawberry industry at the moment. Jamie Michael has been growing strawberries for about a decade. This year's been one of the toughest for his business. A quarter of his fruit will be left to rot because he can't get enough pickers. In peak season, we would have around 300 seasonal workers doing the fruit picking and, and packing. At the moment, we have 140. And just for us in unpicked fruit, we're talking about one and a half to two million dollars worth. Now, if you extrapolate that across the industry, it would be 15 to 20 times that. And to not be able to get it off the plant at the last step, it's heartbreaking. I'm going to take us to Matthew 9, and the harvest is plentiful, the labourers are, are few. Uh, let me read out those verses. You will probably know them well. Um, one of the parts of the Bible that I, I reflect on a lot. Uh, Matthew 9, verse 35, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. That is like a summary verse that we've had for the last two, uh, two chapters. Jesus has been teaching and healing and proclaiming. 
Now we get a little bit more of the summary. Uh, verse 36. When Jesus saw the crowds... Let's stop there for a second. What do you see when you see the crowds? Um, I don't know if you ever... Um, you, know, you might be in the, in the CBD of Brisbane or at a, or a big, um, big sporting game. Uh, what, what do you see when you see the crowds? I think most of us just see people going about their normal everyday business... Uh, enjoying themselves at a concert or at sport or, or in the workplace, just going about their business. Um, they might be well-dressed, they might look like they've got it all, all together. When Jesus saw the crowds, he, he wasn't impressed by the way they look. He didn't just see people at a, at, at a surface level. What, what we hear is when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. Interesting that uh, in the New Testament, we are not told that anyone else um, has compassion on crowds like this. It's only Jesus. We're, never, we're not told that the disciples had compassion on the crowds or the, the Pharisees had compassion on the crowds. Jesus sees something different in people. Most of the time, the disciples were, were telling Jesus to, uh, you know, to stop people coming up to him. Like, Don't bother the teacher. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Harass and helpless is that idea of being... Um, well, harassed is like being, being bullied. I don't know if you've ever been bullied or if, uh, if, you're, um, you know, if a parent hears that their child has been bullied, it's kind of one of the things that makes their, their, their blood boil. That's what Jesus sees when he sees the crowds. They're, they're harassed and they can't do anything about it. They're helpless. They're kind of like sheep without a shepherd. Now, uh, we don't kind of... The image of sheep and shepherds isn't really familiar with us too much, um, even if we have kind of grown up on, on a farm. Uh, but in the, in the first century, the, the idea of a shepherd, um, you know, they, they knew the voice of... Uh, the sheep knew the voice of their shepherd, and that's the way that a shepherd would control the sheep, was just by, by speaking, controlling, protecting, moving them around. And if they don't have a shepherd, they are completely helpless. They are just like, they'll, they'll get themselves stuck in all sorts of things, they'll, they'll, they'll run away. And Jesus says that is what the, the crowd of people are like. Harassed and helpless. I think too often we uh, see people just on a, on a surface level. Uh, but there's one thing that I have learned is that there is always more going on in people's lives than what they show you, particularly at a workplace. Um, and so... Um, Jesus then switches uh, to this, this image of, um, from sheep and shepherds to a great, a great harvest, a plentiful harvest, a harvest that is, that is ripe and ready to be brought in. But there's a big problem. <laughs> there's not enough workers to bring the harvest in. And uh, that clip was during, uh, it was during COVID with a shortage of, of, of workers and kind of articles like this I saw, uh, strawberry prices could rise as farmers reduce crops amid COVID labour shortages. It's, you, know, you can sort of feel it in the farmer's voice there, wasn't it? It's, it's devastating. You've got these beautiful strawberries and they're just going to rot. They just, they just cannot be, be brought in because there's not enough workers to pick them. And that's what Jesus, Jesus says here. Now, obviously, Jesus is speaking metaphorically. He's speaking about people, not sheep and, and crops. Um, and the very next thing that Jesus does is, um, well, firstly, he, he stops and he says that the solution, first and foremost, is to pray. To pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers into his harvest. Uh, I've often wondered, why, why is prayer the solution here? Why isn't it like a committee being formed and uh, people getting on with that, that sort of thing? Um, I think it's because we undervalue prayer. And we underestimate the power of prayer and that, uh, that God loves his harvest, his people. And so we, we should ask constantly for God to be raising up workers for his harvest. I've, um, I've got on my, on my Apple Watch here an alarm that goes off at, at 9.38 every morning. Uh, it went off this morning while, while Steph was speaking. And uh, what it reminds me to do is to stop and to say a short prayer from Matthew 9 verse 38 that God would raise up workers for his harvest. I used to think that this was only applied to kind of convincing people into full-time ministry, uh, because that's the context where I heard this, this, these verses preached all the time, is the harvest, 
you know, is out there and we need more missionaries and, and more pastors and more leaders. And that is, that is absolutely true. But uh, the harvest is also right next door to us. And we, we, we need people to kind of think missionally where, where they are. And so that's why this third image I want you to think of is that you go to work into a, a farm, into a harvest that is, that is ripe and ready. Now, I know a lot of people push back and say, oh, well, there's not many people in my workplace that are interested in the gospel. Now, that might appear to be true, and it might be hard yakka and, and slow, slow, slow progress, 100%. I see it all the time. But we also see that God is at work in people's lives in ways that you, you wouldn't imagine. Um, I'm happy to share uh, story after story of the way when, uh, when Christians can... Um, can open their mouth, can identify as being a, being a Christian, not kind of hide in fear, which I think is the most common thing that most Christians do in their workplace, um, that God does and is at work in workplaces, even in secular workplaces, in secular Australia, uh, God, God is at work. And so um, I've, I found it interesting when I came across this, this quote uh, that says, uh, we are convinced that, that England, uh, it's come from the Church of England, will never be converted until the laity, that's normal people, use the opportunities for evangelism daily afforded by their various occupations, crafts and professions. Now, here's the thing. Uh, what year do you reckon that, that, was, that was published in? We're convinced that unless people use the opportunities for evangelism in their workplaces, that we're not going to see kind of England converted. That was 1945, like the end of World War II. That's like, I don't know, 80 years ago, something like that. Um, so what I'm saying is, is not new. Um, and uh, Billy Graham in the year 2000, I think, said, I believe that one of the next great moves of God is going to be in the workplace. I just think Christians are, are asleep to this opportunity by and large. Uh, it's a little bit like John, John chapter 4. I, I love this. This could kind of be the City Bible Forum theme passage. The, uh, it's the woman at the well story in John chapter 4, but uh, I don't want to talk about that bit of it. The disciples uh, are told, or they go off to buy food in the village. And they go and they, they, they buy food and they bring it back for Jesus and they urge him to eat something. And um, Jesus kind of says... Um, you know, my food is to do the, the will of him who sent me to finish his work. I don't need your, your food at this time. Uh, I've got something else that's bigger and better than food. Um, and it's at that moment that uh, the Samaritan woman had, had left and gone into the village, the same village, I think, that the disciples went to, to, to buy food. And they all came, come out because of the Samaritan woman's testimony about what Jesus had said to her and told, Jesus had told her everything that she'd ever done. So she'd gone back and, and now the, the villagers are coming out and they're hearing about what, what Jesus has done and they get converted. And I think, here's the, the thing that I love about it, the disciples went into those towns and villages and probably saw nothing. <laughs> they just saw Samaritans. They just saw people going about their, their daily business, buying and selling bread and w whatever else it was. And yet here's one woman who Jesus has an impact on goes and now they're interested in the gospel and they come out and they hear and they get converted. I think so often we're, we're like that. I'm like that. Going down to my local coffee shop, um, speaking, you know, people go to their workplaces. God is doing nothing here. If I had a dollar for I, every time I heard someone say, God is doing nothing in my workplace, no one is interested, I would be a very rich man. <laughs> um, but I think that this story shows... Uh, that the disciples didn't get it and that we're often like them, but that God, God is at work. Um, it just takes a bit of courage uh, to be known as a Christian and uh, in the workshop we can kind of un unpack that. What are some of the steps that you can take um, and then can help you think about what to say and all those sorts of things. Um, right. What am I going to... How much more time have I got? Ten minutes. Okay, oh, I can go on. Um, but I don't know if I will. Um, so I'm just going to I'm going to wrap up I think because uh, we can then we have some some question time. Um, so when you think about the place that you work, yes, it pays the bills. Uh, yes, it's tiring. Yes, it's busy. But most importantly, I'm just going to go through those three things again. When you step into your workplace, it is a place where God is and will refine you. 
there are hard things that will happen. There are trials that will happen to you at work. I'm sure you can think of some now if you're, if you're in a workplace. Instead of wishing them away, instead of complaining about them, reframe them as an opportunity, as something where God is going to grow you. He's going to make you more precious. He's going to refine your faith. When you step into your workplace, think this is a place where God is going to be praised through the work that I do and through the good works that I do for others. And when you step into your workplace, can you picture that you're actually stepping into a, a wonderful harvest? There are people here that need to hear about Jesus. And yes, it will be hard. Uh, yes, it might be ones and twos, not, not hundreds. Uh, but God is at work. And so uh, I'm going to finish by uh, praying that, that prayer from Matthew 9:38 that God would raise us up as people who uh, are his people in our workplaces. So let me pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, would you instill these images in our mind? Would you reshape our thinking, uh, reframe our thinking about our work, uh, to see you in it, uh, to not seal it off uh, from you and your ways and what you're doing? Uh, would you raise up many, many of us uh, and many more Christians to be, um, to be your people in, in the place where you, you place us? Uh, that we might see uh, your name glorified and, and honoured and praised uh, through the work that we do, and that we might have opportunities to speak of Christ and his great love and his grace, uh, the forgiveness and the hope that he brings uh, through our daily in interactions. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.